Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Deploy, Configure, and Remotely Manage Nano Server. My name is Andrew Mason. I'm a principal PM manager in the Windows Server Org and I'm working on Nano Server. How many people have heard of Nano Server before this week? Okay, good, lots of hands. How many people have deployed it? Okay, a few hands, that's good. All right, well, hopefully we will get all your questions answered and help you deploy it in this session today. So, Nano Server is part of Windows Server 2016 with the built-in layers of security, software-defined data center, and the cloud-ready application platform. Nano Server plays across all of those, as we'll see in this uh, session today. And so I want to talk a little bit about why we built Nano Server, sort of our journey to get to Nano Server, talk a lot about deploying Nano Server, some about managing Nano Server, and there's another session on Thursday that goes more deeply into management, and then talk about what our results are with Server 2016 and the roadmap going forward. So we've been hearing for a long time from customers, all of you out there as well as others, that reboots impact your business. You know, why do I have to reboot or deploy components that I'm not using on my server, that aren't providing any of the services that my server is performing? You know, it's taking up extra resources. Those images are too big. It takes a long time to install them. Transferring images consumes too much network bandwidth, and then it takes too much storage on the, the uh, uh, machine itself. So why am I deploying all these extra components that I have to manage and configure or that potentially get misconfigured and expose me to security issues? And then it requires too, much, too many resources for my infrastructure. Let me deploy a smaller OS that's targeted just to what I need to run on my systems so that I can increase my virtual machine density, lower my cost, and provide more service to my customers. And then over the last few years, we've all seen the various headlines about all the different hacks that have happened, you know, hackers getting into systems, stealing data, damaging systems, or even damaging physical hardware. Um, and so the less you have running on your servers, the less services started, the less ports open, the, the more secure that service, server is going to be. So really, we've been hearing for a while from customers that they want just the components they need and nothing more. So let me deploy just enough OS, and that's where Nano Server fits in, as we'll see. Now, for Microsoft ourselves, you know, we start out our server journey with Windows and Windows NT back in uh, Server 2003, Windows NT before that, where a server was really just, you know, a desktop tower tipped on its side. You know, the real difference between workstation and server was a registry key. Mark Lucinovich kept finding that registry key and posting how you could, and creating tools for changing your workstation into a server. We kept moving it, Mark kept finding it, and so we finally hired him, and now he's CTO of Azure. So I guess if you do bad things, it comes around, right? <laughs> um, so with Server 2008 and 2009 R2, we sort of signaled this shift of removing the GUI from the server with Server Core. So Server Core was sort of a, a stripped down version of a uh, server with a desktop, where we removed a, the shell and a lot of the other components that used the GUI. It had some basic functionality in there, so GDI was still there. You could still, so you could still RDP into the server. You could still run some basic UI like Notepad and RegEdit and Task Manager on the machine. But it really signaled a separation of, you know, remotely manage your servers and use remote UIs to manage or use PowerShell or other remote mechanisms to manage your servers. Then with Server 2012 and 2012 R2, we layered everything. So from Server Core, you can convert up to a minimal server interface which added more functionality but still didn't have the full UI, and then you had the GUI shell on top of that. And so that provided some flexibility to help people move towards server core. And you know, going through that process with, with Azure, you know, Azure does not use live migration in the data center. So every time they have to patch a host, that incurs downtime for the, the virtual machines running on that host. And Azure has, a, as you heard Scott talk about yesterday, a large number of data centers all around the world, lots of servers across all those. So that large number of servers plus the, a large OS utilizing resources on that machine, both the disk and the, the processor and memory, equals a higher cost of goods. And provisioning that you know, across all those data centers takes a lot of time. There's a lot being transferred over the network. And then with Cloud Platform System, which came out, I guess, October of 2014, you know, that's sort of the cloud in, a, cloud in a box where you can get one to four racks of hardware with Windows Server and System Center pre-installed, so you have your virtualization environment all configured for you. Well, that requires a long setup time. Now, while that environment does use live migration, 
So reboots don't necessarily incur downtime. There is a lot of data being transferred around in those live migrations, so it impacts the network utilization. And as, as well as your host capacity. So you have to time each host to, to reboot. A compute host takes about two minutes to patch and reboot, whereas a storage host takes about five minutes to patch and reboot. So you have to, you have to co coordinate that across the, the racks. So really, we discovered that we also need an operating system that's optimized for the cloud or for your virtualization environment. Something smaller, something lighter weight, more focused just on the task that it, it's going to play on the network. And so that's where nano server comes in. So the nano server installation option provides just enough OS. And really what that means is you get higher density, reduced attack surface, and reduced servicing requirements. So it's the smallest installation option of Windows Server 2016, really focused on your virtualization or cloud host. You know, that smaller image size gives you much faster deployment time, much faster reboot time when you do have to reboot, and smaller attack surface because there's less installed by default in the base image. You know, and then server cores there for your existing virtual machine workloads that can't move over to nano server yet. It provides you sort of a stepping stone. So if you can't fully transition to nano server, you know, move to server core on a path towards nano server. And then server with the desktop or the full GUI version of servers there as well for third party applications that really require the graphical interface as well as for running RDS. So RDS H is available on top of that. And so on the application side, nano server is really focused on your cloud born applications using the cloud patterns, microservices, things like that. So it runs in a container, it runs in a guest, and it runs on your physical machine. And as I'll talk about briefly, because there's a development session tomorrow, we also have integration with the SDK and Visual Studio with Nano Server. There we go. So Nano Server is really our next step in the cloud journey, our hybrid cloud journey. Like I said, it provides a just enough OS model. And what that really means is we've separated out the side by side folder in Nano Server. It, there's a small one there with a little bit of metadata required for patching the system. But unlike server and server core, where the side by side folder has every roller feature you could ever possibly want to install on that server, we separated all the roles and features so they install more like applications. So if you're not using clustering on your nano server machine, you'll never have cluster binaries in the image. Unlike your full server images, all your physical machines running full server and all your virtual machines running full server, they all have fax binaries in them, even though there's probably nobody in the room who has the fax server role installed. Anybody? Ah, a couple hands, all right. So some people still do use it. I should stop picking on fax server. <laughs> um, so they're all separated out. You don't have those binaries unless you absolutely need them in your image. So you can build the image for the role or the purpose that server is going to play. Now, it does have a subset of roles and features. We don't have everything that's available on server core. So we have Hyper-V, Scale-Out File Server, Clustering, DNS Server, and IIS. We also have some of the supporting functions, like Defender's available. So if, you, if you're not using third-party anti-malware, you can install Defender. We have TPM support, so you can run shielded VMs on top of Nano Server. We have SIL, or software inventory logging. So if you want to track for compliance purposes all the different versions you have installed, as well as the virtual machines, you can do that. PowerShell and PowerShell desired state configuration are both available as well. Then ASP.NET Core and ASP.NET uh, Core and ASP.NET Core are both available as well. Now, with Nano Server, while it's a very stripped down install, it does use the same underlying kernel and networking and storage stacks. So the same, and same driver stack. So any driver that works with server 2016 for a physical hardware device will work with nano server as well. Now, installation of that might be a little different. You know, if, if the driver package is only available with MSI, you'll have to extract the drivers out and inject them in the image. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then we do have offline support for installing drivers as well as in uh, the GA version of nano server. You can, PNP util has been added, so you can also install drivers online. So you don't have to rebuild your image if you realize you left out a driver. And then for System Center, the Virtual Machine Manager and Operations Manager agents are both available. So those can both be installed and be used to manage your nano server instances. So just want to talk briefly about it as an app platform. There's another session tomorrow morning talking about how to develop for nano server. 
and some of the differences. So nano server like server core is a further subset of the Win32 API surface area. So not every Win32 app or tool you may have will run on top of nano server. We do have some tools available to help you scan your apps to see what changes might be required. Um, like I said, .NET Core, ASP.NET Core are both, both available. PowerShell desired state configuration. Package management is available on Nano Server as well for adding and removing third party packages as well as inbox components. And then we have a feature called the reverse forwarders that allows a lot of existing tools and open source app frameworks to run on top of Nano Server. So we have blog posts about how you install a lot of these open source app frameworks on top of Nano Server so that you can use it as your your application host or your container or guest. And it is available everywhere. So you can install it on a physical machine, both boot from VHD as well as installing from a whim. You can run it as a guest OS in a virtual machine, or you can run it in a Hyper-V or Windows Server container. So both types of containers are supported. Oh, there we go. So talking some about deploying and configuring Nano Server. So it is an installation option like server core. However, you won't see it listed in setup because it, you have to customize the image. The nano server WIM, because it is so small, and one of the things we've removed is user mode plug and play. So unlike when you're running setup for server core or server with a desktop, where it kicks off plug and play, detects the hardware, and installs the right set of drivers, that wouldn't happen with nano server. So if we had put it in the list of setup options and you had not customized that image, you would have deployed a non-bootable machine. So we put it in a separate folder on the media. There's a nano server folder that has everything you need for creating your nano server image and deploying your nano server image. There's a packages subfolder under there that lists all the packages that you can deploy on nano server. So this is the list of what's available with server 2016 nano server. So the compute package is Hyper-V. Now, just like I was talking about the just enough OS model, we've even broken up Hyper-V some. So if you're not going to use containers, you'll see that's the second one on the list. That's the containers package. If you want containers with Hyper-V, you have to deploy Hyper-V in containers. Then down towards the bottom there, you'll see um, shielded VM. So if you want shielded VM support, you install that on your machine. So you build up the configuration for what you're going to use and not have a bunch of extra functionality just installed on that server that somebody might misconfigure. So DCB is data center bridging. I mentioned Defender, DNS, DSC, clustering. The guest and host packages. So we've also separated the configuration for running on a physical machine. There's some low level drivers for hardware in that package with the guest driver package. So again, you're building your image for the target is going to run. You don't have extra functionality or drivers in the system that you don't need. IS, I mentioned OEM drivers is an interesting one. So OEM drivers is all the drivers that are available in server core. So if you have a machine that you can pop in the ISO for server 2016, deploy server core on it, and it runs with just inbox drivers, all the drivers you'll need to run nano server in the OEM drivers package. I'll talk more about that later. Um, I mentioned VMM secure startup is BitLocker. So if you want to use BitLocker with your nano server machines, you would include that. Um, software inventory logging, I mentioned. Storage is essentially clustering, MPIO, iSCSI, and all the different storage technologies are in that package. So under that nano server folder on the media, there's also a folder with nano called nano server image generator. And in there, we have a PowerShell module that gives you several scripts you can use to build your image. So there's new nano server image, there's edit nano server image if you want to reconfigure one of them, then there's a way to get package and get optional features. So rather than having to use DISM to build your image and do a whole bunch of DISM commands, because I'm sure everybody loves DISM, right? Easy command line tool? That's what I thought. So we created this script, it does all that for you. There's a bunch of parameters on it that I will talk about that allow you to build your image. So. This slide talks a lot about the different configurations you can put on here. And I should point out here, the guy there, he was also on the earlier slide. This is, this is Nano Man. If you stop by our booth, we actually have a Nano Man comic book and poster you can pick up. So stop by the Nano Server booth in the Expo Hall. Um, but there's a few things that you have to do with every Nano Server image you build. 
So you want to include the right set of drivers, whether you're running in a virtual machine or in a physical machine. You want to set an administrator password. You have to pick the deployment type, whether it's going to be host or guest, so you get the right set of low-level drivers in there. And then addition. So nano server is part of standard and data center, so you have to pick which addition you're going to deploy. So the, really the only difference between nano server, standard or data center additions are um, S2D support and shielded VM support. Those are only available in the data center, so there's only one package that's different. Then there's a bunch of optional things you can do as part of building your image, and this is all configurable via that script I talked about, so you can add whatever roles or features you might want that image to play. You can set the computer name, you can set your IP address, both IPv4 or IPv6, or both. You can domain join, you can change the size of the VHD from the default. You can also specify an unattend file or a setup complete file. So everybody's probably very familiar with unattend files. You can set your computer name, you can set various other things in the unattend file. Setup completes a capability that's also been around for a while. And it allows you to specify a setup complete.cmd that runs at the end of setup. So this is essentially a setup run once commands for all intents and purposes. So you can put various commands in that setup complete.cmd and have it execute on first startup. Now, one of the things we've done with Nano Server is some of the settings that you might put in an unattend file, we actually put in an offline section of the unattend file. And so what this does is on first boot, those settings are applied to the system and your machine is up and running. So like computer name, you can set in the offline section of the unattend file. On first boot, that gets processed, the computer name gets set, and you're up and running on the network with that computer name. So there's no need for that second reboot that normally happens with a sysprep image or an unattend file because it's processed on that first boot rather than booting up, processing the unattend file, and then rebooting to actually set all the settings that you specified. So it makes it very quick to deploy a nano server image. Um, another thing you can include in your image as you're building it is the latest cumulative update package. So you can take the latest servicing package and actually inject it in your image as part of building that image so that it also gets applied when you start up your image versus you know, booting a nano server image and then having to go off and have it scan and install the latest updates. Um, you can configure remote uh, WinRM access. So by, by default, WinRM is enabled, but it's only enabled so that you can access from the same subnet as your nano server machine. So like if you're deploying in a cloud, like an Azure VM of nano server, your machine that you're connecting from is likely on a different subnet. And so you would want to enable remote WinRM access to that virtual machine. And then we also have debugger support and emergency management services. So you can enable both of those through the script. So you can see from the, the table on the slide, I won't go through everything here, but there's a lot of different switches and parameters you can set as you're building your nano server image. And this is great because it gives you lots of control, but it also gives you lots of switches to try and remember and figure out which way or which ones you want to use as part of this. So like under IP address, you can see there's a set of switches for IPv6, and there's a different set for IPv4. And so you, this will be available in the deck for your reference. It's also in the nano server deployment guide. Like I said, I talked through most of these. So what I really want to talk about is first installing drivers and then something new we have coming for you. So I mentioned the OEM drivers package has all the drivers that are available in server core. So that allows you to build an image that's going to run on a lot of pretty common hardware out there. However, for the leanest nano server image, that OEM drivers package is 20 some odd megabytes in size. So you're, you're increasing your image size some and you've got a lot of drivers in there that you may not need. For the most optimized nano server image, what you want to do is figure out the set of drivers you need in your image and include just those, rather than the full OEM drivers. So you can include that. I mentioned the guest package. I'm sorry. Let me go back one. So there is also a drivers switch on here, which I left off, and I'll talk about more in a moment. So there's a drivers parameter that you can use to specify a path where you put all the drivers that you want in your image, and anything in that folder, it will automatically inject in the image. So that allows you to build something specific to your image or your machine. Now something new we have coming is Nano Server Image Builder. 
So we got a lot of feedback that, like I said, the PowerShell script is great, makes it much easier than using DISM, but you guys should make it even easier for us. So we have this tool called Nano Server Image Builder, which is essentially a GUI tool that will step you through building a Nano Server image. Now, this will not be on the Server 2016 media. This will be a download from the uh, Download Center. But it is on track as of earlier today for being available at GA in mid October. So, this should be available to everybody, and I will show a, a demo of this. But this actually gives you two different options. So, you can either use the first option there, create new nano server image, to essentially it steps you through the GUI of the um, image building script. So it asks you all the same questions. There are a couple of minor differences, like it allows you to do a couple of things that the script doesn't do, like set the VLAN. So if you need to configure your image to boot up on the network on a particular VLAN, you can do that through this GUI tool. And then the second option on the screen there is you can actually create a, US, a bootable USB stick. And so this is not to run nano server from a USB stick. This is actually so you can build a USB stick that will deploy it on another machine. So you build the USB stick on your laptop or your desktop machine, and then you can take that USB stick over to a, a, your physical machine, plug it in, power it on, and it will deploy nano server on the machine for you from that stick. And so it asks you a few questions about how you'd like the, that machine partitioned. So it creates a little script, puts WinP on there, puts that script on there, puts your image on the stick that you can then use to, to boot your machine and actually deploy reformat the, the server and apply the image. Now, whether you're using the image building script or you're using the nano server image builder GUI tool, the output of these tools can be used with your favorite deployment tool. So if you're using WDS to deploy your machines, you know, pixie booting and running W and letting the pulling down images from WDS, you can put nano server images in WDS and use WDS to deploy at scale. So this tool, as we'll see, like I said, it steps you through all the different choices you have in the, in the GUI, in the script. So here's the page that lets you select which roles and features you want to include in your image. And then I will, hopefully my demo, I'll use zoom it so it might be easier to see. But one of the nice things is at the end, as it's building the image for you, it shows you the PowerShell equivalent of what it just built. So you can copy the PowerShell off the bottom of the wizard page there and then reuse that the next time you want to build an image with some, some tweaks based on, you know, what that new image needs to perform on the network for you. So let me switch over to my laptop here. First, I'm going to take a look at basically this is the, the eval version that was released yesterday. So 14.393, and then I did a directory li listing of the nano server folder. You can see we have the image generator folder I mentioned, packages folder, you know, and the actual WIM and a brief readme. So if you look at the packages folder, that's essentially going to be the list that I had on that slide. These are all the roles and features separated from the image. A new nano server image generator. I will just import that module. And just so everything fits on the screen, I will you can see the, the fly out with the help, all those switches I mentioned. So it's great because it gives you maximum flexibility to build the image that you need, but it's a lot of switches to remember. Now one thing you can do is you can use the show command This was working before. <laughs> uh, hang on. 
Well, you can use show command, and so you can get the fields where you can enter everything that you might want for a new nano server image. I will come back to that in a minute. I'm sure I imported it because it was working. Well, let me switch over. So here I have a virtual machine with the new nat with the image builder wizard running in it. So I'm going to create a new nano server image. And it gives you sort of the standard before you begin text. And then you tell it your installation media. You can see it has gone off and already detected that I'm using English media here. So I'm going to go ahead and click next. Then it shows the EULA. So I will accept that. And that lets me determine if I want to deploy a VHD or a WIM. So it will automatically put in the guest or the host package, depending on my choice here. So I'm going to do a WIM. And you'll notice it automatically grayed out as soon as I did WIM the maximum VHD size, because that doesn't really apply in a WIM. Oops. All right. And then it will let you, as you're stepping through the wizard, create that USB stick, but I'm going to skip that for now. And so then it's asking me about drivers. And so what it's done here, let me zoom out. So what it's doing here is it's actually mounting the, the WIM and then it's parsing it to see what packages are available. So the tool doesn't have to get updated every time we release a new build of nano server. It automatically checks the nano server version that you're looking at and builds the list of packages to display in this dialog box. So it takes a, a minute or so, depending on what kind of machine you're running on. So let me zoom back in here. And so you can see it's now showed me the list of packages that I showed in that directory listing for data center, and you can drop this down and select standard. But I'm going to go ahead and create a Hyper-V host here. And click next. Now here's where it's going to ask about drivers. So if I have additional, if I have non-inbox drivers that I want to add to the image, basically I can specify one or more paths in this dialog box. And what it will do is it will go automatically use DISM and inject whatever drivers it finds in, in those folders into the image for me. So I'm going to skip that for now. And then you set your computer name. You can set your password for the default administrator account. And your time zone as well. Not Eastern Island. There we go. So you can see it's basically stepping me through all the switches in there. I can do domain join here if I want, either with the domain name or a blob file. And here's where there's a few differences. So this enables WinRM, like I said, if you're on a different subnet, you want to enable WinRM remote management. So there's a checkbox here to enable that. Enable virtual LAN allows you to set a, a VLAN ID for your network. This is not available in the PowerShell script, so this is specific to this UI. And then you can configure your IP address. And so you may notice there's draft in brackets in front of some of the text here. That's because it's still going through some editing passes, but the draft in brackets will get removed before we release it. Um, and then it gives you the option to create your basic image or Excuse me, there are some advanced settings you can configure. So here's where you can specify your servicing package. So like if there's a, a servicing update available that you want to make sure is in all your images, you can include that as part of the image and it will automatically get applied. You can specify a setup complete file. So if you want it to do some additional tasks not available through the configuration settings available in the tools, you can add a, a uh, setup complete file. You can enable emergency management services. You can set up the debugger and set up, you know, whether you want to use KDNet or SEAL ports. And then it gives you a summary of what you've selected here. 
I'll go ahead and click create and then unzoom. And so you can see it started the process of building the image and it gives me the PowerShell command line down here. So this is actually a UI that layers on top of the PowerShell image builder script or image generator. So you could copy this and then just run that command line against the new nano server image. So I'm going to pause this so it's not eating up my disk while I show the rest here because this is a, a cooking show obviously. So I'm going to create a USB stick that I've already generated the WIM image for. I have that locally on my laptop. So I'm going to go C colon backslash demo. You can see as soon as I finished typing the file name, it grayed out and started thinking about things. It's actually mounting the WIM file, so it's going to tell me how that, how that image is configured, so I can make sure that's the image I really wanted to use. So here's my image information, and you can see compute containers. Oh, this, I forgot to check failover cluster. It's a host because it's a whim. I put OEM drivers in because it's a, a host and shielded VMs as well. And so from here, then I can click next. Oops. It lets me select my USB drive. I have one plugged into my laptop here. And then here's essentially I can select the boot mode I want to use on the machine that I'm building, as well as set up the partitioning scheme for that particular machine. So I can select my, this 12 gig partition here, maybe I want it to be bigger or smaller, I can go ahead and adjust that and set the file system on it. So if I then click create here, what it's going to do is reformat my USB stick, put WinPE on there, generate a script based on the partitioning information I had entered, and then copy over that nano server compute WIM file. Then I take that over to another machine. If I power on and tell that machine to boot from USB, it's going to boot WinPE and automatically run the script to partition it and then copy over and, and do dism apply image of the WIM file. So then I can take out that USB stick, reboot my server, and I've got a nano server physical machine up and running. So it's an easy way if you have a few physical machines and you want to get nano server running on them to test things out or work with nano server, you can use this tool so you don't have to go off and build your own WinPE bootable stick or anything. So that's, that's new, that's not available in the technical preview, it's not available with the eval. Like I said, it's going to be a download and we're targeting that to be available from the download center at GA in mid-October. And so we'll also put something on the nano server blog about that so it makes it easy for everybody to find that. Now the other thing you can do, and uh, we first enabled this in technical preview five of nano server, so you can also install roles and features from an online repository. So one of the things we did with technical preview four last fall was we made the nano server technical preview four available in the Azure gallery. However, we realized that, you know, if, if we put that in the nano, in the Azure gallery and somebody booted up that virtual machine and it didn't have any roles or features available, probably wasn't going to be very useful. It was going to be somewhat difficult for somebody to then connect up to that virtual machine, copy in the cab files they want to use, and then install the roller feature on top of that virtual machine to get it running in Azure. So we sort of broke a just enough OS model because we put a packages folder in that virtual machine. So I was talking earlier about how none of the roles and features will be in your image. Well, we broke that immediately in Azure. So what we did between technical preview four and technical preview five was we worked with the package management team to create a provider for nano server. We created an online repository with those roles and features. So with technical preview five in Azure, when you boot up that virtual machine, you can then use package management and we'll go off and download any roles or features you want to install on that machine. And so this works on-prem, it works on your VMs, you know, anything with internet access can use this. You can also use package management to download those and put them on a file share and then use package management against that file share to install a roller feature. So you don't have to, you can 
create more of a generic nano server image and then use this to customize it for the roller feature it's going to play on your network. So, as long as the network is still working here. So I've got a nano server virtual machine running on my laptop here that I'm going to create a PowerShell session into. Okay, so now I'm connected to my nano server machine and I'm just gonna change directory back to the root so you can see the command line better. So this registry key here, HP local machine, software, Microsoft, Windows NT, current version, server. This has been available in server 2012 as well as 2012 R2 to allow you to detect in your code or scripts or whatever whether you're running on server core or server with a desktop. In server 2016, we've added another level called nano server. So if you have some script or utility you code you have that you want to adjust its behavior based on what it's running on and whether or not it's going to pop a dialog box or something, you can use that registry key. And then there's also a new command that called git computer info. This is sort of like uh, system info but on steroids. So it shows you all your different Hyper-V and device guard configuration, as well as other information about the system. So you can see lots of data in here. Like I said, system info on steroids. But you can also sort of filter this down. So one of the things it has in it is server level. And so you can use this to check for nano server. So that was a long-winded way of just proving that I've remoted into a nano server machine. <laughs> so no tricks here. Um, so first I'm going to install the package provider. So there's a nano server package provider. And this will take a minute because it's going out and seeing what providers are available. And the repository uses NuGet, so it's also going to pop up and ask me if I want to install NuGet. So I'm going to click yes. And then yes to all. So I've now installed the nano server package provider. I'm going to import that. And then I can run find package. So this is going off and querying the repository. And you can see it has all the, all the packages that we've been talking about and seen on the various slides and in the other demo available here. And it shows the, the OS version they're targeted for. So these are the RTM versions of the packages. And then you know, as an admin, you know, maybe I'm connected up to a, a machine, it's a Hyper-V host, I forgot to install the VMM agent on that machine. Rather than going off and rebuilding a new image and redeploying an image, I can use this to go ahead and download the, the VMM packages and install it. And you know, rather than having to go off on another machine and go up to TechNet and figure out the names of the packages, with this you can also do wildcard searches. So I can just search on VMM and it's going to show me the two VMM packages. So I don't have to remember the full name. I can do a search on the short part and get the, the full name. And then git package with the provider nano server package will also show me what's installed on the system. So you can see right now I have, this is a Windows Server data center image. I have the Windows foundation, essentially the base of everything installed. And then it's running in a virtual machine, so I have the guest package. So pretty vanilla image. Just to prove I'm not cheating and putting a packages folder or anything in, you know, I have just the basic Windows folders. I'm going to do DSC since it's pretty straightforward. You'll see if I do a directory listing of my machine, I have WDS core because that's part of the Panther engine which is part of the servicing stack. And then I have um, the KDS clients. You'll see in system 32, I have just those two binaries, so no, no tricks again. So I'm going to tell it to go off and install DSC. And you'll see it starts processing it. It's going to pull down the DSC package. It's going to pull down the English version of that because I'm running in an English VM. So it will automatically install the package for the language of the system. And then if I run the git package again, we'll see I now have my three packages plus the DSC package. So that was a pretty quick and easy way to get DSC installed in my image. 
And if I run through and do my directory listing, it certainly looked like a lot more scrolled by. If I scroll up, we'll see there's definitely more there. And now in the PowerShell folder, I have some of the DSC binaries, and in System32, I have DSC as well. So it's an easy way to get, you know, maybe you forgot to include something in your image. It's an easy way to get that installed in your image for you. So that's a nice new feature we enabled to make it easy. You know, we heard a lot of feedback that, oh, I forgot to install a certain package in my image. Now I have to go either rebuild my image or figure out how to get the CAD file in the image and figure out the DISM command line to install it in the image. Package management makes it much easier to install packages. Right. So installing agents and tools on nano servers. So I've talked a lot about building the image and the inbox capabilities of nano server, but you know, Everybody has agents they use on their machine. Everybody has a variety of tools they use to manage and monitor their systems. So Nano Server does not have MSI support. MSI is a very open installer, so custom actions essentially allow the author of that MSI to run any code or any tool or executable or script as part of their installation. So it'd be very hard to kind of bound the probably tens or hundreds of thousands of MSIs out there and for an admin to know whether a particular MSI was going to work on nano server or not. So instead, we have a couple options. So some, some of the ISVs and others that we've worked with are using PowerShell scripts or copy item or xcopy to deploy their bits onto a machine. But we've also started building a new installer called WSA or Windows Server App Installer. So this is built on top of AppX. So it uses the same underlying commandlet, same underlying manifest, and everything is AppX. However, we've added a bunch of server-specific specific extensions. I'm going to talk more about this in the um, developer session tomorrow if anybody's really interested in getting deeper on it. But it allows you to do things like install NT services. And so we've actually busted through the, the container or the restricted environment that most AppX install in. So anything you install with this new installer has uh, full access to the system. We've been working with a bunch of the installer companies to extend their tools to allow you to generate both an MSI as well as a WSA. So I want to talk some about managing Nano Server. There's Nano Man again. So again, comic books and posters at the booth. It's very cool. Um, there's also a hollow lens, a couple hollow lenses at the booth with a, a virtual nano man experience if you want to try it out a hollow lens. I think the marketing guys got a little carried away, but it's better than no marketing support, right? <laughs> uh, so nano server management. Our, our goal with nano server, because it is headless, there's no way to RDP into the machine, is to eliminate the need for you to ever touch a machine or sit in front of a, a, a server ever again. So we have PowerShell. You've seen me use PowerShell in a couple of demos to access my nano server machine and to build a nano server um, image. Well, it's not all about PowerShell. So PowerShell is definitely one option, but as you'll see, there are other ways to manage your nano server systems. So you can use um, WMI as well. And with PowerShell and WMI and DSC, we integrate with all the DevOps tool chains. So for those that really want to automate up their process and their management and configuration, that's all possible but you don't have to use PowerShell to manage Nano Server. So your existing MMCs and tools, remote GUI tools, will connect up and manage Nano Server. So Server Manager can connect and manage Nano Server. If you're running Hyper-V on a Nano Server machine, you can use the Hyper-V Manager MMC snap in and manage it. The DNS MMC connects up to a, a Nano Server machine running DNS server to allow you to manage it. So you can use the GUI, the big thing is instead of RDPing into a machine and running the GUI on the machine, you run the GUI on a, a desktop machine or a jump box or something and remote into the nano server machine. Same set of tools though work against nano server that you're familiar with running on top of server with a desktop. Mentioned PowerShell, so Perfmon, Event Viewer, all of those tools. But we also have a new set of tools that we've been working on called server management tools. So this is a new web-based UI, and there's also a booth for this and a management session later in the week where we're going to go into a lot more depth on this, but I want to skip through PowerShell Core and talk about that some more. Um, PowerShell Core 
you might have noticed I keep referring to it as PowerShell Core, not just PowerShell. It is a refactored version of PowerShell. So instead of running on top of the full .NET framework, it runs on top of the core CLR. So it does have the full language compatibility and remoting, supports all the commandlet types, but it does have a subset of the commandlets. We've worked really hard to get all the commandlets in box that make sense on a nano server machine. Um, you know, if you have feedback on something we may be missing, we'll certainly enable that. But like the Hyper-V commandlets are there, so you can use the Hyper-V commandlets either remotely from your machine and connect up to a nano server machine, or you can use PowerShell remoting to connect into a nano server machine and run the commandlets locally. Same thing with DNS. The DNS team did a great job of making their very extensive set of commandlets available. The one gap we have in there are the cluster commandlets. So the cluster commandlets are only available to run remotely. So you have to run those either on your desktop or a, a jump box and connect remotely to a nano server machine. They're not available locally. We're working with the clustering team to change that. Um, but server management tools. So like I said, it's a set of web-based remote management tools. We got a lot of feedback, especially on server core, that it's great that you removed all the UI but there's still a lot of things that I have to RDP into the server for. There's no remote equivalent for them, like control panel network or control panel Windows update. You know, how do I do those things remotely? You know, for networking, because you remove the UI when I RDP into nano server, I have to use NetSH, which again is not a very friendly command line tool. So our, our goal with the server management tools was to start out by replacing the local only tools, fill that remote management gap. So we have replacements for control panel network, for Windows update, um, for task manager. There's a remote web-based task manager so you can see the status of the network and the CPU and the disk on your remote servers through a, a remote UI. And then we started putting a bunch of the commonly used MMC snap-ins snap into this tool set. So registry editors there, event viewer, uh, Windows firewall, the serv equivalent of services snap-in is there. So a lot of the tools that are commonly used when you're trying to fix something on a system, we're putting into this tool set. And over time, we'll, you'll see more and more tools added to this. So because it is web-based, right now the front end is hosted in Azure. It's not tied to the server release, so we can keep adding tools to it even though server 2016 has gone GA. So you'll see more and more tools being added to this. And the way it works is the, as the diagram shows there on the side, the front end sits in Azure, so you use a browser to connect up to Azure. And it does require an Azure subscription, but it is free, so you won't get billed for using this. Then you deploy a gateway on premise, and that gateway uses HTTPS to pull Azure to see if there are any requests for any of the servers it's managing in your subscription. And then it uses PowerShell or WMI to communicate with your servers. So once the gateway gets a request, it then reaches out inside your network using PowerShell or WMI to make the management change or get the data that you want to view. And so it's all based on WMI and PowerShell. Anything you can do in the UI is available to do through your own scripts, tools, automation, whatever you want to do. And so we've had to add a bunch of new WMI providers into the system. So like I mentioned, there's a replacement for Windows Update. There's now a Windows Update WMI provider, so you can actually Scan, do a remote call with WMI to have a server scan for updates and apply updates instead of having to connect into that machine or use third-party tools for that. And it does manage nano server, server core, and server with a desktop. So it's not specific to nano server, although obviously it provides great benefits to nano server. It is available in public preview, and I've got the link in the um, later slide. Big long list of tools there. I talked about a bunch of those. One of the nice ones also the PowerShell console. So once you've logged into a particular server, you can then have this whole tool, tool set available to you. It's not like MMC where you keep having to load snap ins and reconnect to the server in a different tool and enter your credentials or anything again. You've, you've connected that server as an admin and you have access to this tool set. You don't have to keep re authenticating. And with the PowerShell console, you can click on that and it gives you a PowerShell remoting session into it. And there's a script editor and a way to save scripts in your blob store on that, on that particular node so that you can reuse them as well. So we've got a lot of nice capabilities coming in this. Again, there's a session, I think it's 12.30 on Thursday where we're going to demo a lot of this, and we have a demo booth set up in, down in the expo hall. And in addition to nano server, server core, and server with desktop, it's also available to manage 2012 and 2012R2.
set up and boot event collection is another new feature available in server 2016. Again, this one is not specific to nano server either. This works against server core and server with a desktop as well. But we initially started building it because we realized nano server being small and headless, you know, large data center deployments at large scale, you know, a lot of those are remote. If something fails in the installation process, how do you troubleshoot that? You know, today you'd have to get somebody to go boot into WinPE, copy log files, send them to you, let you look at the log files. Okay, here's a new unattend, try and deploy, that fails, repeat the process. And that's all great and wonderful as long as you can get another OS running on there or you even have video on that machine. So we actually, um, when we were working on designing this, we talked to a bunch of the Microsoft service teams and actually found a team who had bought a whole big rack of headless servers. They didn't even have video cards in them. And they could not get Windows Server, I don't remember at the time whether it was 2012 or 2012 R2 to install. They couldn't figure out the right set of drivers because there was no video, they couldn't boot into anything else to copy the logs off. There was no room in the machines in the rack to fit a video card. <laughs> so they actually had to get some power tools and in the top machine in the rack, they cut a slot so they could fit a video card in so they could troubleshoot it. So this is the solution that does not require power tools. What this does, it allows you to, to configure KDNet and so as soon as the kernel loads up, it turns on KDNet and then it streams all the ETW events from the boot process or from setup off box to a collector. And so the collector is a Windows Server 2016 instance, could be a virtual machine, and you configure the collector on that, all your ETW events stream up to that and they all get collect log there. And so you can use anything that can read ETW files to monitor them, like message analyzer. And so in real time, you can see the events happening on the server. You can see maybe why it's failing to boot, you know, bad boot device, the driver's failing to load, you know, and then you can get the right driver and retry. So you don't have to go reboot that into another OS, copy log files off and go analyze them. You can do this all in real time. So it, it's a great tool for helping you recover and you can enable or disable this as needed. So maybe when you're provisioning a new set of hardware, you initially turn this on to make sure things are getting provisioned correctly. And then, you know, once you're certain your image is good, you turn it off and you don't use it again. Or you can keep it running so you can monitor your boot process and when servers are rebooting throughout your data centers. But it's a new uh, tool that's available to you for helping troubleshoot. And the other thing we've added that some of you have probably seen is the Nano Server Recovery Console. We made a few changes to this between Technical Preview 5 and uh, GA. I will demo some of that in a moment. But essentially what this does is, you know, I keep saying Nano Server is headless, there's no remote management, there's only remote management and you can't RDP into it. Well, again, all that remote management is great, but if you mess up your network and you can no longer remotely connect, you know, you don't necessarily want to have to rebuild that image because you mistyped an IP address and don't know what you typed in. So the recovery console is the solution to that. So as long as you have, you know, physical access with keyboard and video or BMC access or if you're running in a virtual machine have um, VM Connect access, you can use the recovery console to look at your network configuration, fix your network configuration and then go back to using remote management tools. So I have another virtual machine running on my laptop here that I'll connect into. Let me scroll down. So I'm gonna go ahead and enter a PowerShell session to that. I'm gonna, oops. Arrow, not page. I'm gonna get my network adapter configuration. See, I've got Hyper-V virtual network adapter on here. You know, this is probably a bit of an extreme example, but I'm gonna accidentally disable my network adapter. So you can see PowerShell ISC is not very happy about that because I was remoted in. So let me close that. No, I won't save that. Let me relaunch PowerShell ISC and open my demo file here. 
you can see if I try and connect to this again, it's going to fail here in a moment because I have disabled my network adapter. So what I can do though is because it's a virtual machine, I can go over here to the recovery console and log in and then I can go into my network, my ethernet adapter and you can see it's disabled and all I have to do is hit, you see it timed out in the background there, all my PowerShell red text. Press F4 to re-enable it and then if I go back to the beginning there's F5 here to refresh. And it has started again but it has not shown me in the IP config. Um, but I can change from static to dynamic IP address in there. I can configure um, V4 and V6 IP addresses. We've also separated the firewall rules and the inbound and outbound. So if you accidentally enable a firewall rule that's blocking remote management, you can use the recovery console to reset that. And then WinRM is basically allows you to reset WinRM or you can also, by default what it does is it also enables remote WinRM. So from any subnet. So if you forgot to configure that when building your image, you can also use recovery console to fix that. Now another thing we included here is VM host. So this is new in, in GA. Not exactly networking per se or recovery. But it does let you look at the VM switches configured on a, on a nano server Hyper-V host. So this, this machine where I now have re-enabled my IP address is a Hyper-V host and I'm actually running nested virtualization on here. So let me connect back in. And then if I go back over here, uh, if I look at guest status, I can see I've defined one virtual machine on this Hyper-V host. So I'm running a, a Win 10 client on my laptop. I have a nano server virtual machine with Hyper-V installed. And then on top of that, I'm going to turn on another um, virtual machine here. So let me go back to PowerShell ISE and start up nano server 2. And so it looks like it started up. Let's go back. And so you can see nano server 2 is now running. You can see I caught it during the boot process, so CPU usage was kind of high. I didn't give it a lot of memory because my little laptop here is going to fall over with all these VMs. Um, but if I go back in, you can see it's down to 2% CPU utilization. So you can use the recovery console now. We got a lot of feedback that is very common when managing Hyper-V hosts to go into VM Connect and use the Hyper-V tools to see what's running on the system. You know, are the, are the VMs I expect up and started on the machine? Are they using resources? Well now with the recovery console you can get a quick view of that as well as remotely using the GUI tools or remotely using uh, PowerShell command line. So to recap some on the management, really we're, we're going down the path of DevOps mindset. Treat servers like cattle, not pets. You know, we're trying to enable as much of the tool set and infrastructure as possible. Our big focus is to eliminate the need to ever sit in front of a server. So that's where the server management tools come into play. That's where all this PowerShell remoting comes into play. The ability to then use um, existing MMC snap-ins to manage your nano server machines. And then we have PowerShell to help you automate and script. So this is all very good and wonderful. And I've talked a lot about how nano server is smaller. You can build just the image you need, you know, but I've also talked about how there's a bunch of things you have to do a little bit differently and is it worth making these changes in your environment? So really what, what is the difference between nano server and say server core or server with a desktop? So on the security side of things, there are fewer drivers loaded than server core. There's a lot less services running by default, so back to that just enough OS, not having that exposure on the network that you don't need, and that's also reflected in the, oops, list of ports open. So 12 ports by default compared to 30. So that's a pretty significant difference, pretty significant reduction in attack surface area. As far as resource utilization goes, process count 21 versus 26. Boot IO, again, this is where you get the fast startup times, 108 megabytes compared to 306. 
and kernel memory needs 61 megabytes versus 139 megabytes. So that allows you to boot very quickly. Um, we have virtual machines booting in two or three seconds. In containers, if you go to the container session, Taylor Brown has some great numbers on how fast nano server versus server core containers start up. Um, we have a demo down in the booth where we reboot a virtual machine and actually reboots on that hardware from running to reboot and running again in eight seconds, which is pretty impressive. So even when you do have to reboot a system, you're back up and running in production very quickly. As far as deployment improvements go, 35 seconds to provision a nano server image compared to five minutes for server core. And so this again is because we moved a bunch of settings into the offline section, everything gets provisioned on that first boot. You don't get that second reboot that uses up a lot of time. Disk footprint, nano server is about 460 megabytes on disk. That's the base. Server core is about five and a half gigabytes. Server with a desktop is about 10 gigabytes. So significant savings as far as your physical infrastructure goes if you're running on a, on a host. Significant savings if you're running a lot of virtual machines with nano server in them. Again, it goes back to that just enough OS. And so, you know, you're probably wondering, we're, you know, Microsoft's gonna add more capabilities to nano server. There are other roles I want on nano server. Yes, we're going to do that, but we will always keep the base at that small 460 megabytes. So as new roles and features are added, like I said, they're all separated. They're cab files that you add to your image when you want to use them. So they're not going to cause the base to grow like server core did. So, you know, if you're running a Hyper-V host, you can have that 460 megabytes. If you're running some other role in the future that requires a bunch of additional um, functionality to be added to the image, when you're running that role, you'll have that bigger footprint but only for that role. It won't impact the rest of the roles and features that you might want to run or an app that you're running on top of Nano Server. And then VHD, when you're running in a virtual machine, there's a little bit of overhead. You can see it adds pretty significant amount to a server core VHD, but a Nano Server VHD, all of 20 megabytes. So pretty lean and mean. And then this is a great quote from a customer case study who's been working with us in our TAP program and has had technical preview five in production for a while now. So they've actually used it to increase their VM density on their Hyper-V host. They used to do eight VMs per Hyper-V host. They're up to 12 to 14 VMs per host. And they've also reduced their operations overhead on those nano server hosts by 70% because there's less that gets installed, less they have to manage and configure when they're installing it, and then less that gets mismanaged or that they have to keep an eye on as that system is running. So can significantly reduce the operations overhead and the cost of management, as well as increase your virtual machine density and ability to run additional VMs. So I want to talk a little bit about the servicing model. You may have heard some of this. We announced some changes in the way the servicing model works in July. So there's two servicing models for those of you familiar with Windows 10 clients. I guess they technically have three because they have a CB in there somewhere. Um, there's a long-term servicing branch. And so this is a traditional servicing model. You get five plus five years of servicing. So it's security and quality fixes only, no new features or functionality. And that's the model that server with desktop and server core will use. So those are both releasing in October as, as LTSBs. So very much like server 2012, 2012 R2, 2008, 2008 R2, that's sort of the model that server has always used. Current branch for business is a, a new model. With nano server, we're releasing it as a current branch for business. So it is on the server 2016 media, but it, nano server on that media is not an LTSB like the other two installation options. It's a current branch for business. So that means it won't get that five plus five years of servicing. You'll have to move forward as we release new versions. And it also does require software assurance. And so the reason we decided to make nano server a current branch for business or CBB release was we know there's a lot of additional functionality we want to put on it. There's a lot of, you know, industry is changing rapidly. We're very focused on the, the cloud scenarios. So we want to keep adding, being able to release functionality in a rapid cadence and provide improvements to all of you out there and react to your feedback as, you know, if there's other ways you want to be able to manage or connect into the system or capabilities you want on nano server, we want that ability to respond to those quickly. 
So it doesn't change any of the features we've been talking about since last Ignite when we announced Nano Server. You know, all the same set of features, same level of quality and functionality. And installation of a new CBB will not be, I guess, like the Windows 10 model, where you get a pop up saying there's a new build and next time you reboot, it's going to be applied. As an admin, you control that. So you will download the next CVB and decide when you roll it out to your machines. It's not automatically installed. And so this slide sort of shows how this works. 2012 and 2012 R2 were both LTSBs. So they get that five plus five years of servicing. Server 2016, server core and server with desktop are LTSBs, so they get five plus five years. Nano server is a CBB, essentially. With 2016, it's CBB1. And then this shows there will be future CBBs and future LTSBs, but for example purposes, we'll talk about CBB2, 3, and 4. So, like I said, you have to move forward to a new CBB, but you can be up to two behind. There we go. So, when CBB2 comes out, CBB1 will still get service, to so still get security fixes and everything for that. So, you could stay on CBB1 if, for business reasons or whatever, you didn't want to, were unable to move at that time. When CBB3 comes out, servicing for CBB1 will stop shortly after that. So you'll have to move forward to two or three. When CBB2 is out, that will stop receiving servicing after CBB3 and so on. So CBB3 will stop receiving servicing shortly after CBB5 comes out and on down the line. So you can be up to two versions behind. So the roadmap, nano servers, the, the future nucleus, the future of Windows Server. You know, it's the target for your cloud applications. A lot of the cloud app frameworks, open source frameworks, born the cloud applications, microservices run on top of it. Gives you that just enough OS model to build the OS you need for your environment. You know, not everything's going to run on nano server. I picked on fax server earlier. A few people that use it, so sorry. Um, we still have server core still there for your existing applications, for helping you start migrating towards the smaller environment of nano server. Now, one thing I did want to mention, I've talked about nano server being available for physical, virtual, or containers. Server core is also available for physical, virtual, or containers. Server with a desktop is only physical or virtual. You cannot run server with a desktop on a container. So if you're moving to containers or apps to your containers, you'll have to get onto server core or a nano server. Those are your two container options. And then this slide has a bunch of resources. So go out, try Nano Server, deploy it, give us feedback. Because it is CBB, we'll have that ability to respond and make improvements very rapidly. We do have a very detailed deployment guide available. There's a blog with a lot of additional information, a bunch of videos on Channel 9, and then various forums you can use to give us feedback. And for the remote management tools, we have the same thing. There's a blog to get you started with that and a, a feedback mechanism for that as well. I think there are a bunch of related sessions to Nano Server as well. So that development section I talked about, there's the management section. Um, there's a review of sort of the cloud OS for DevOps that I'm presenting with Jeffrey Snover later in the week. There's a Nano Server and Hyper-V session, and then there's also notes from the field session. So uh, a couple of the team members from the TAP team that have been working with our customers will be presenting about a lot of the learnings they had from those customers. And there is a hands-on lab available. So with that, Oh, there's a bunch of additional resources. I stuck this slide in. Please fill out your eval, and uh, I am open to questions. I'll leave this up so you can see the other sessions, and I will put up the, the list of links. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks for sticking around. <laughs>